Good. Well, I get you're tired of looking at middle-aged white guys, but I'm number four on the list. It, you know, we tried, we tried, but it's maybe it uh, speaks volumes. But, you know, I, I grew up in the socialist left in Britain, and I didn't pay much attention to the environmental crisis. I didn't really know there was one. I knew there was pollution, and I knew that was bad. I knew workers got harmed by it. But like most people of my age, we grow up not really aware of ecological degradation, the kind of ecological degradation that is now accelerating on the planet uh, in the form of climate change and other problems. I took the view that there were crisis tendencies in capitalism and that sooner or later, if we organized right, workers would get it and we would have a global movement and we would bring it back about a democratic socialist system. That's what I thought was going to happen. That's what I still <laughs> hope is going to happen. But one of the clearest things that I think personally I've learned, and suspect other people in this room have learned, is that the true crisis tendency in capitalism is ecological. It is the collapse of the world's ecosystems, driven by growth, accumulation, and profit. And unless that is intercepted and reversed in a democratic way, involving everybody, or all, all people, then we are facing the biggest crisis human civilization has ever faced. You've probably heard 25 people say that already today, but I want to let you know that that's where I come from too. Now on the labor climate stuff, I, I've observed three phases in this and I uh, want to try to summarize them if I can. First of all, others have talked about the divisions between jobs and the environment. A lot of union people felt environmentalists were tree huggers. I don't think that requires much more of an elaboration. What is worth focusing in on, though, is that the left of the labor movement also took a view um, of was rather disparaging of the, of the environmental movement. And so criticism of unions, left and right, I think is legitimate on a certain level, that hindsight is always 2020. But I think we also have to have a lot of criticism for the environmental movement also, particularly in the US. The mainstream environmental groups are completely uncritical of the capitalist system except that they want, obviously, a greener, friendlier, more humane capitalism, but they do not challenge the fundamentals of profit, growth, and accumulation, for the most part. That's changing to some extent with the climate justice and more left environmental organizations where there's more of a rich debate. But we have a problem with the big greens and the mainstream environmental groups, not just with the labor movement. So in my view, both have to shift. Now, we did see them shift about seven or eight years ago with the Apollo Alliance. Some of you may know about that. You've probably heard also of the Blue-Green Alliance. This was basically a coming together of two movements that were in a tailspin, in decline. The labor movement hasn't won a decent reform in 35 years. The environmental movement, similarly, has not won a major reform, probably, correct me if I'm wrong, since the Clean Air Act. They haven't won very much. <laughs> Small gains here and there. The system, meanwhile, carries on towards Armageddon. I don't want to sound like a, you know, that final days kind of person, but going in that direction. And both movements have not been able to deal with it adequately. And so when they came, the blue-green narrative came out of a, a position of weakness of both movements, believing, though, that the theories of ecological modernization that we can save capitalism and at the same time keep growth and create jobs and have a more humane, fair system. That was the basic narrative that informed that movement. So the unions, like the steelworkers, a bunch of other unions, the SEIU, the Sierra Club joined with them, and a bunch of others. That's the Blue-Green Alliance. I think what we're facing now is the exhaustion of that narrative. It's not happening immediately. It's, gonna, we're gonna, it's not going to exhaust on its own. We have to struggle with it. But the facts are indisputably on our side right now. The institutions are not. The money is not. Perhaps the skills base is not for the most part. But we're accumulating what we need to do to accelerate the final end of that narrative. And I, I think... This uh, requires a, just a little bit more focus. If we look at it globally, the trade unions, I've been working in unions in the international area for quite a few years. 
What we saw around about 2005, 2006, 2007 was with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, with the Al Gore movie, there was unions and environmentalists understood that there was opportunities to rebuild their own movements. Then what happened is the United Nations Environment Programme suddenly got a lease of life and decided that it was going to present what they called the Green New Deal. It was a, not the Green New Deal of the Green Party, I hasten to add, not the Green New Deal of a quite a number of other organisations would support, but it's basically a transition to a form of green capitalism which requires first and foremost the commodification of nature, to put a price on nature. And you know the theory. I don't think anybody here is, is unfamiliar with it, but I'll repeat it just in case. That is, if anything is free, it's going to be abused. So therefore, if you put a price on it, it will be valued. That's the simple message of the green capitalists, the theorists of Amory Levins and people like that. That's the United Nations Environment Programme's perspective, and that's the perspective of a wing of the capitalist class who believe, who take a more long-term view of their own system. I was in a meeting about six years ago at Columbia with Jeffrey Sachs, and he stood up and he said, Capitalism will not survive another 20 years unless we can move towards sustainable forms of business. And that was his message. He sent, it out, he sent out a message to the Walmarts of the world and all the other corporations who were in the room. I gate crashed, pretending I was somebody else. <laughs> saying that the system is at a crossroads and it needed to go in a certain direction. And what we have witnessed in the past few years... With the, with the economic crisis of 2008 and the financial crisis is the resurgence of the fossil fuel companies and the capitalist wing of the capitalist class that really doesn't want to see any change whatsoever. Up until the time of the UN Copenhagen talks, late 2009, you could say that things were slowly going towards the green capitalists, that they looked like they had the arguments on their side, there was a financial crisis, Obama came in, along with other governments around the world, and put $2 trillion of stimulus money, a lot of it earmarked for green investments. So there was a feeling that that was the way things were going to go. You had Rudd was elected in Australia with the same kind of program. Even conservatives like Angela Merkel said the same thing. That now is history. That is gone. There is going to be no global climate agreement coming out of the UN, no matter what the State Department might say as they lead up to it about their concerns about climate change. Obama is given the orders, if maybe not Obama, but Todd Stern, who works for the administration, is telling the U.S. negotiators, don't you even think about a global agreement to reduce emissions. Any agreement is going to be, even if it came out and it won't, will be completely inadequate and unable to deal with the crisis. Now, one thing we have to say is, what's the economics underlying this resurgence of fossil fuels? And I would say it comes down to three words. Supply, demand, and money. Forget peak oil. Forget peak coal. Forget peak gas. Yes, if we carry on using it the rate we're using it, it'll probably run out in a couple of centuries from now. But the idea that it's already running out and there's no fuel is not true. And we have to get this clear. The International Agency, Energy Agency in the last couple of years have produced reports. There are a trillion tons of economically viable coal on the planet. New sources in Kazakhstan, Mozambique, all over the world is opening up. Meanwhile, the tar sands. If you think the Alberta tar sands is the only tar sands patch in the world, think again. There are others, and some of you know that already. So extreme energy is on the agenda. The more that comes online, that satisfies the supply, or that meets also the demand. The demand is coming mostly now, not from the OECD developed countries, although they still have the lion's share of demand, India, China, Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, the Philippines, South Africa, all of these countries are growing at such a rate that the demand is there. And what demand does is it raises the price. So it raises the price above, in the case of oil, 80 90 $100 a barrel. That makes tar oil profitable. 
And that's why you've seen $150 billion of investment go into Alberta in the last 10 or 15 years. It's viable, it's profitable. So you've got the supply, you've got the demand, and you've got the money. We don't, no one in this room is unaware of the massive amounts of profits made by the fossil fuel industry. But I would ask you to compare it to the profits made by the wind and solar industries. They're like this in their margins. They're losing jobs, they're losing market share, they're being killed by shale gas, and at the end of the day, the fossil fuel companies are walking, wiping the floor with them. That's what we're dealing with. It's the death of the green capitalist scenario. We have to face up to that fact. So I've got like two minutes left, I believe. So I'm just going to, you did say 12 minutes. That's what I was told. That's what I prepared for. <laughs> so what do we do? What do we do? The labor movement now is split. The building trades in particular have aligned themselves with the fossil fuel companies. They're basically inseparable from each other. That's pretty clear. Look at the building and construction trades. They have websites that they share with the industry. They're not really unions anymore in, in many senses of the world. They're in an alliance with the industry. The left unions, we've talked about them, the nurses, the transport unions, <coughs> they are weak at the moment. But what's encouraging is even though they're weak, they're beginning to show a little bit of um, understanding of what needs to be done. What's most encouraged, I think, is what's happening on the global stage. Because there was a big debate at the Rio Plus 20 conference. This was a green capitalist-like festival. The trade unions got together, and the unions from Europe came in and said, we think green capitalism is better than dirty capitalism, so we're going to go with green capitalism. Everybody on board? And guess what? Loads of unions, largely because it was organized in Brazil. The Brazilians, the Argentinians, the Andean region, the South Africans, the South Koreans, all said, we are against the commodification of nature. We are against the, what this system is doing to the planet, that workers and the environment are abused um, in equal measure by this system. So that was the message. It, it's a, it opened up a new struggle within the labor movement around a new discourse and a new vision. The last point I would make is this. System change we need, but we do need a transitional approach. We can't just assert that it's capitalism. I don't think anybody in this room accepts, or we all, we all may be against capitalism, many of us are, but we do need an idea, a roadmap on how to get from one system to the next. And I would say there are certain strategic <laughs> sectors, and we've referred to them before. Energy is the most important sector in my view. We have to have a campaign for energy democracy. The people must take back the energy system from the corporations. We must decommodify electrical power in order to then enhance energy conservation on a massive scale. We must decarbonize the transport system. We must do what we can to reduce emissions within the science-based scenarios that have been made available to us. Only if we come out with a sort of a clear idea of how we go, I think will eco-socialism resonate with people. Because to assert that it's the system stupid is extremely important and valid. But the next question is, so how do we get from here to there? And we're only just beginning to think about that, and I look forward to participating with you and trying to put some flesh on the bones on some of those issues. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody.